What's going on, Al? What? No, no, Al. You never fail to crack me up. The girl in the picture is not suffering from chicken pox. I assure you. Why is she covered in dots? Well, those are meant to be Bendet dots. Bendet dots were used in printed comics during Lichtenstein's era. You see, Bendet dots, or halftone, which is very similar, works via optical mixing to create colors. Very good, Al. I'm glad to see you remember that. Yes, this is the same type of process used in creating pointillist works, where two colors that appear side by side influence the color which we perceive. For example, blue next to yellow will appear green at a distance. Yes, the same is true for modern screens. Pixels work in combinations of red, green, and blue to create optically mixed colors. Good question. Lichtenstein is using these Bendet dots not to portray color like the pointillists, but rather because he is recreating and formalizing comic book imagery to make a statement. Thus, rather than painting the skin tones in a typical fashion, he has retained the Bendet dot texture so that we understand the connection between his paintings and the mass-produced printed materials he is referencing. It's all about surface quality and portraying deeper meaning in this case. What do I mean? Well, surface quality is the quality of an artwork's surface. Wow. It comes in one of two forms. The first is the physical texture or presence of the surface of a work. For example, the way that the paint lays on the surface of a canvas. Does it break across the canvas's weave? Perhaps it lays perfectly flat on the surface, so much so that there is no differentiation in the physical paint application. Both have very different effects psychologically on the viewer, thus they impact the meaning of the painting differently. The second form of surface quality is implied quality. This deals with the dimensionalities found in painted iconography of a work. For example, it is a contrast between the painted velvet and the soft skin of a figure on the same canvas. Both aspects of the iconography should have very different appearances when depicted in paint. As such, we react differently to each depiction. Much of the surface quality deals with formal elements like texture and pattern, but more than this, it deals with the artist's approach to mark making. Well, mark making is literally what it sounds like. It is the marks laid onto a substrate by the artist. These marks can come from a variety of sources. For example, Raymond Pettibon uses a pipe cleaner dipped in ink to get the striated lines that often appear in his artwork. This homemade tool allows for him to get linear consistency and create complexity within his work with minimal effort. In contrast, Jackson Pollock would splash, drip, and drizzle paint on the surface of his canvases to break away from this idea of consistency and predictability within his paint application. Mark making and surface quality are hugely important in the vitality of an artist's work. This idea was not lost on Lichtenstein, as can be seen here in this 1965 work titled Brushstroke. Here, Lichtenstein is making another statement. He has taken the impetus of the artist's brushstroke and undermined the organic nature of the thing. What we are left with is a screen printed facsimile of the expressive brushstroke that elevated Lichtenstein's forebearers to the heights of painting. They were the abstract expressionists. Their style, often referred to as action painting, relied heavily on this idea of truly organic, expressive, and pure painting. It was painting for painting's sake, working on similar philosophies to the Kantian ideology of beauty for beauty's sake. Here, Lichtenstein is saying that such ideas are dead. They have been usurped by the mass-manufactured consumers' culture of the 1960s. It is a powerful idea, and it is supported by the surface quality and mark-making employed in the creation of the canvas. You see, Al, had Lichtenstein not screen painted this canvas, a technique that was used in industrial manufacturing, not fine art, then he would have had to paint the image by hand. Doing so would have introduced mark making into his painting, even if he had attempted to mask this by using historical techniques like those employed by the smooth painters. The smooth painters? Well, they were the historical school of painters who believed that the artist's hand should not appear in any way in the final painting. Their belief was that it fell upon the artist to mask their presence in the depiction of their subject. It was pure mimetic painting with pure iconography. No brushstrokes were present, only the imagery of the painting, in as much lifelike detail as the artist could muster. In many ways, the philosophy is shared in the more contemporary hyper-realistic movement. This ideology was contrasted by the rough painters, who, akin to the Impressionists and eventually Abstract Expressionists, felt that loosening their brushstrokes and allowing them to show enhanced their work. The philosophy of which essentially goes that including the artist's hand in the work engages and involves the viewer within the process. This extra level of depth and visual interest speaks more about the psychology of the painting and the psyche of the painter. Of the rough painters, historically, Titian is one of the most famous. 
You can see in his work that there is a looseness and visceral nature to the way in which he portrays his subjects. It adds to the story and compels us with the energy of its surface quality. Both schools still exist today, and in today's pluralistic art scene, they serve distinct purposes. However, even if Lichtenstein had employed the philosophy of the smooth painters, there would have been an issue. You see, no matter how realistic or hyper-realistic, the reality is that the artist would have been making the marks by hand. In the case of Lichtenstein's brushstroke, the interaction of the artist with the canvas would have removed the significance of the piece's message, as it would not have embodied the move away from the artistic process towards mass-manufactured processes. You cannot disenfranchise the ideology of fine art by creating a work of fine art. So, you see how. The philosophy of mark making and surface quality go beyond what we might first imagine. It is vitally important as artists and as critics that we take such matters into consideration when analyzing our own work or the work of others. Just like color or composition or any other factor we use when interpreting work, the surface quality and mark making techniques are pivotal in making informed judgments. Take for example the work of Lucien Freud. Freud uses an impasto paint application in his working process, but it serves a much more complex purpose than simply adding texture. In Freud's work, the rough, almost broken and grainy paint application seems to symbolize inner strife and imperfection. These are not smooth, beautiful depictions of people. Rather, they depict much deeper sentiments in the way Freud saw the world. The result is engaging work which draws us into his world and makes us strive to see beyond the surface, and to truly see the figures with all their imperfectness intact. In juxtaposition to this is an artist like Vincent van Gogh. Van Gogh uses an impasto paint application as well, but with an altogether different result. Van Gogh's work has an intensity equivalent to the work of Lucien Freud, but the intensity stems from the portrayal of movement and light throughout the work. Van Gogh illustrates his vision of complex and fascinating color relationships. He also shows us a world which is constantly changing. The world through Van Gogh's eyes feels vibrant and alive, as if it is a living, breathing entity. There is also a sense of idealism that shines through in Van Gogh's work even in his darker moments. In contemporary art, mark making can take on much more abstract qualities. However, they are equally important to consider when discussing the work. One of my favorite examples of this is the work Darky Town Rebellion by Kara Walker. Walker depicts for us a caricature of a rebellion by African American slaves. She does so by using intricate silhouettes which are hand cut and then placed on the gallery wall. These are then illuminated by abstractly colored lighting. Aside from the multifaceted commentary that is present within the physical imagery that Walker presents us with, is a very clever and nuanced aspect of the work that often gets overlooked. Walker has illuminated the scene from behind, and as the viewer engages with the work, the lighting actually casts the viewer's silhouette onto the walls alongside the scene. This is a contemporary form of mark making. Walker is making us a part of the scene, a part of the history surrounding this narrative. We have become one of the silhouettes on the wall. In this case, Walker is creating the mark with lighting, a concept which is elusive, especially if we are used to analyzing mark making in the physical sense. Excellent question, Al. As you can see, there are countless ways through which the artist can create marks. For many, the concept of heavy impasto paint application or mixed media tends to be the limit of their perceptions regarding this very important aspect of painting, yet there is much more to consider. As an artist, you should consider what you are trying to portray in your painting. By doing so, you can then decide how to approach the mark making and surface quality of the work. For example, the idea of portraying stillness in a minimalist way is likely not suited to thick expressive paint application. Yet, you might find that thick paint application that simulates the ridges present within the rake stones of a Zen garden might suit your design very well. Equally effective, might be the equidistant balance of a series of rings which feel as if they are suspended in time and space. Or perhaps a more contemporary solution may be to use a mirrored surface that infinitely reflects like the glass-like surface of still water. Any of these solutions may work, but it is up to you as the artist to decide which is appropriate for your vision and which communicates that the most effectively. You might ask yourself, am I a rough, loose, smooth, or hyper-realistic painter? What is your goal as an artist? What is your natural inclination toward mark making? No artist approaches mark making the same. The brush stroke is like a fingerprint. It reflects the individual artist who made it. This can be developed though. You can experiment to create a more developed visual presence within your work. 
To do so, you want to create different ways of creating marks and experimenting with the way these affect the surface quality of your pieces. One of the best ways to create a variety of marks is to create your own tools like in the Raymond Pettibon example I gave. Try bundling sticks together. Perhaps try imprinting different textured objects into your thick paint. Maybe try scrapers, brooms, squirt bottles, string, etc. There are literally innumerable ways in which you can make marks on your canvas. Try eliminating your brush strokes altogether. Try printing on your canvases like Lichtenstein. Or think abstractly about how you can create marks like Kara Walker. These nuances in the way you approach mark making and surface quality will play a big part in the telling of your story, both in the pieces you create and the type of artist you are. There are also a variety of manufactured mark making devices for sale as well. They may not all be viable to you in your process, but you might just find an option that works well for you. Also, don't forget to consider how removing paint and media from your canvases can impact the look and feel of your work. What do you mean I didn't answer your question? Yeah, I know I avoided giving you a direct answer. Yes, Al. Warhol did pee on some of his canvases. Yes, Al. That is still considered mark making. You do realize you don't have a bladder, right? Oh, that's just gross.